Oh, church, welcome to this week's message. My name is Henry Loke. This is God's Feeding Station. It's an honor to be with you again this week. Made it back from Vegas in one piece, uh, but they don't call it Sin City for nothing, let me tell you. But everybody knows that. Uh, it was an interesting trip. Interesting trip. Um, girls played well, uh, but Vegas is Vegas, so it is what it is. Uh, we are back in Romans this week, probably one of the most comforting passages in scriptures, I think. Romans 8, 31 through 39. Uh, it's going to kind of, I, I think it settles the argument about how God really feels about us, about God, how God really feels about his creation and should lay aside, help us lay aside all those fears about being separated from God, being um, in such a state that God is just angry at us all the time and maybe doesn't even love us anymore. Should put all that to side. So let's get into it and we'll talk about it. We're going to take it bit by bit this week. Uh, beginning in passages 31 and 32, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us as well, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things. It's interesting to note here that Paul uses the same words that God used when speaking about Abraham. Abraham, if you remember, uh, as I, I, I'm sure all of you do, proved his loyalty, showed his faith, demonstrated absolute trust and faith in God when he was willing to sacrifice his only son, who he waited years and years and years for, Isaac. He was willing to sacrifice him when commanded by God. And in Genesis 22, 12, God speaks of him like this. He's like, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Now, Paul says, and again, we have to remember who he's speaking to. He's speaking to Jews in Rome. Right? Jews who obviously would know this passage of Scripture very well in Genesis because Abraham is revered. Abraham is the father of a nation. Abraham is the one to whom God promised to make a nation of Israel and would lead them out of bondage to the promised land. All these covenants, all these promises, and the covenant was made with Abraham. So the Jews would obviously know this. And so Paul is saying to them, look, what is the greatest example of faith from a human perspective that you can think of? This would be it. After promising Abraham and Sarah, after they were long past childbearing age, that God would indeed grant them a son, now God says, sacrifice your son. And we know, we've talked about this you know, why God would do this, because Isaac had become the be-all and end-all to Abraham. God had to help Abraham reset his sights, right? Reset his priorities. And when he obeyed God, he showed that God was to be his be-all and end-all. And through that, God restores Isaac back to him and blesses Isaac beyond anything that Abraham could have ever done. So Abraham's the obvious answer to the question of, what is the greatest example of human faith that you can think of? So then the question is, if man, who is sinful in nature, can show such faith and obedience to God, such loyalty to God, that he would sacrifice his only son, then how much more loyalty would that God show us, right, in his grace and his love and his mercy to his people? Right? As a man willing to sacrifice his son to God, right? God now is willing and does send his son to be sacrificed for us, right? for the sins of man, for the death sentence that that sin carried. And now that death sentence is removed. And the sins of men are not only forgiven, they're forgotten, right? not to be held against us. So Paul is showing him, look, if... If we as humans can demonstrate such loyalty and such faith, how much more then 
will the God that we show that loyalty and faith to, how much more than will he return that and show that back to us? Right? So surely a God like that who is willing to sacrifice his son and did so, not only willing, but did so, how, how, how can a God like that not be trusted for everything and anything? So continuing in 33 and 34, he says, Who shall bring any charge now against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Right? Paul's questioning here. He says, if God acquits us through Jesus, who is there that can possibly condemn us? If we are acquitted by God, there's absolutely nothing on the planet in creation that can bring any charge against us. If Jesus died for our sins, which is the thing that stood between us and God, and now he's raised and sits at God's right hand, what can possibly separate us from him? There's nothing. Nothing. Right? If Jesus conquered death and sin on the cross, sin bringing death to those who commit sin, and now it's been dealt with once and for all, there's ap there, that, that was the thing. Sin was the thing that separated, separated us from God. Jesus conquered that on the cross. If that's now been conquered, what else is there to separate us from God? There's nothing. There's nothing. It's been dealt with once and for all. So who can possibly condemn us when the only one who has the right to Jesus, right, by his buying us with his blood on the cross. If he's not going to get, if the only one who has the right to condemn us does not do so, but sits at the right hand of the Father and intercedes for us, who is there left? Who's left to condemn us? There's nobody. Right? He's the one that bought us with his life. There is no one else who can. No one else has that right to us that Jesus now has. And Barclay points out a really interesting thing in verse 34. He says, look, Paul makes four definitive statements about Jesus in verse 34. He says, he died, he was raised, he sits at the right hand of God, and he intercedes for us. Now, it's interesting that two creeds that are still prevalent in Christian churches say something a little different. The Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed. The Nicene Creed says this, For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. Apostles' Creed is similar. Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, which that's a whole other conversation. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. The two creeds agree with three of the four of Paul's statements in verse 34. The fourth one, though, is vastly different. In the creeds, it says that Jesus will come to judge the living and the dead. But the fourth point Paul makes is that Jesus sits at the right hand of God the Father and pleads our case. And in John 12, Jesus says this, beginning at verse 47, If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, 
what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. So he says, the word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. Well, we know from the beginning of John that the word was God. Acts 17, 30 and 31 says this, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. God is the judge. God is the lawgiver. Only the giver of the law can be the judge. Now, he can appoint others to judge in his stead, but the ultimate judgeship lies with God. Now, we can think of Jesus as a judge because, again, he has certainly earned that right by his death and resurrection. He has earned that right to judge. But Paul is saying something different here. Paul is saying he is not our prosecutor. He is our advocate and he intercedes for us and will stand with us before the throne to argue our case before God. And we will be found not guilty in him. So a vast difference here. A vast difference here. So Jesus is the lover of men, Paul is saying. He went to the cross willingly as a victor out of his love for us because he understood what had to be done. And he loved us, loved us enough to do it. So why then would he not stand for us and advocate for us when the time comes after so costly a sacrifice? Why would he give his life only to see it be in vain if we are to be judged guilty? Makes no sense. It makes no sense logically. So the creeds and Paul see it very differently when it comes to that fourth point. And scripture tells us that judgment lies with the lawgiver, God. So when we think of Jesus, again, we can think of him as judge because he's earned that right. But the Bible says no. He is our advocate and he stands with us and for us and intercedes for us at God's right hand. Verses 35 and 36. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. So knowing all of this now, right? what can possibly separate us from God? Again, knowing what it costs God to ransom man, God willingly being able to do that, to sacrifice his son, what then can separate us from God? What, I mean, literally, in the world, what in the world, literally, can come between us and God? Again, I go back to the biggest problem we face, the biggest issue that comes in our relationship with God is sin, right? Sin, wages of sin is death, that's its consequence. They've been dealt with. They've been conquered. What else is there? Now, <clears throat> excuse me, we can sin willfully, and the Bible is very clear on that, right? It damages the relationship, but do we lose our salvation? The Bible doesn't say that, at least as far as I can see. Now, there may be times where there's a lot of separation. I mean, Paul talks about, you know, banning people from the church and from the body and letting Satan have them so that you know, all this stuff can be sorted out. But nowhere does it say that we lose salvation because of anything, either that we do or that anybody else does or that the world does. Right? Because the things of the world are temporary. They're all going to fade. They have no consequence when it comes to God's rule, God's law, Yes, it can cause problems now, obviously. I, again, I just came from Vegas. Trust me. I, I know 
the temptations and the sins that the world entices us to do. But again, the things of the world are going to fade away and God and God's law and whether, we're, whether we are in Christ or not, in the end, are going to be the only things that matter. So rather than the things of the world separating us from God or us allowing the things of the world to separate us from God, they should bring us closer, shouldn't they? Right? Because we should now, in the Spirit, start to see things as they truly are. By the, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we come to a deeper understanding of what's really happening here and what is really happening here. Ephesians 6, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. It's a spiritual battle. And we know that this spiritual war is won. We have that in Scripture. We know the war is won. The battles have yet to be fought. We know how things are going to end. And so we understand why persecution comes because the things of the world and the things of God are at odds. And if we stand for the things of God, we are going to come under persecution. Satan is going to throw everything he can at us to get us off the path. So we have to remember, what does Jesus say about the world? In it, not of it. He has overcome the world. We are in him. The old life is dead. We've been raised to a new life in Christ. If he has overcome the world, we then too, with the help of God, by the blood of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, will overcome the world as well. And we rely on God now to help us conquer the things that we face on a daily basis. Right? So rather than the things of the world separating us from God, they should bring us closer. Because we know, the Bible tells us, that the things of the world are going to come at us to try to get us off, to persecute us, to undermine us, to test our faith. How are we going to stand? We stand by the blood of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. And rather than the things of the world driving us away from God, we need to draw closer to Him. Verses 37 through 39. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. To the point. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. If we live in Christ, we live... We live, if we live in Christ, we live in Him through obedience to God and God's Word. Being in Christ means that it's a different, different deal now. Things that we may have dismissed as not a big deal, not too big a sin, it's okay. Now we look at, now we look at things differently. And we try to be obedient, again, not salvation by works, but we try to be obedient to God out of love and understanding for what's been done for us. And Jesus says this, right? If we are obedient to God, Jesus says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. So when we are obedient and we obey the words of Jesus out of love for him because of what's been done for us, that's where that comes from, right? Understanding that there was a huge exchange on the cross, his life for mine and for yours. We're obedient now out of respect and love for what's been done. And so they come and live with us. And so if now we live with him, in death, the old self died with him, the new Henry or the new self is raised with him in his resurrection. 
And as he was raised, we too shall be raised to new life. Right? Physical death is just the passing through the door into the presence of God. That's what that is. Now, there's some, you know, arguments over the timing of everything, right, when you read Revelation. But the bottom line is, death of the physical is just a passage. It's a door. It's a step into what awaits. And so it's not the end. It is the beginning of a new life in him for eternity. Now, it's interesting Paul mentions angels in verse 38. Why angels? What does that have to do with anything? Well, again, we remember who Paul's talking to, right? The Jews had a very deep belief in angels to the point that everything had an angel. Everything had an angel. Winds, clouds, grass, thunder and lightning, warmth and cold, seasons, everything had angels. And the rabbis taught that there was a hierarchy of angels. There were three levels. Level one included thrones and cherubim and seraphim. Level two included powers, lordships, and mites. And level three included angels and archangels and principalities. And they also believed that the angels were hostile to man, that they were not really happy with God when he created, when he, when he created creation, when he created man, right? When he created the world. They, it's almost as if they really didn't want to share God with man. That's, that's what the rabbis believed. And legend had it that when God gave the law to Moses on Mount Sinai, the angels were there attending God, and they were not happy that God gave the law to man. The, again, the legend says that they assaulted Moses on the way up Mount Sinai and would have stopped him had not God intervened. So, again, remember Paul was a Pharisee. So he's using what he knows, what he grew up in, to tell everyone, not even angels, not even jealous angels, can come between us and God once we're in Christ. It cannot happen. And so when you look at all of this, it's like Paul's going, look, you can look at the world or you can imagine quite a lot. Um, those who deal with anxiety, you know what your mind can do to your body, how anxiety can physically harm you, right? So we can imagine quite a lot, quite a lot of awful things. Um, and, and the world can throw a lot of, of hard times at us as well. I mean, I, I was just, uh, I've been, I, I know a woman who just went through a very, very long, drawn-out medical issue. And she's come out on the other side and survived it. But when you look at all that she went through, it's like, how do you, how do you even get through the days? And she said at one point, there were a couple times that she was just, you know, asking to die because of all that she was going through. So it can get bad. I, I understand that. It can get pretty bad. And you think about how Maybe we used to think about God before we really knew him, right? We used to think maybe, you know, and, and this is the, the criticism of the Old Testament God, quote unquote, that he's a God that's just waiting for us to step out of line so he can take us out behind the woodshed, you know, and take us to task. And, but we come to understanding in Christ now, we've come to that understanding that no, that's not who God is. We know better, right? We now see God as Father, right? We see what He's truly like in His Word and in His Son. Jesus is the exact representation of God. So we see what God is truly like, right? The love that Jesus showed all those around Him is the same love that God has for all of us and that He shows us on a daily basis. And so we understand too that things that come into our lives, however extreme they may be, whether they're blessings or trials, they all come for a reason. They come to sometimes test our faith, to grow our faith, to come closer to God in our trust and reliance on Him, to rely on Him 
for all things. And we understand that those things that we need and those things that we come and turn to him and rely on him for, he's ready and willing to give them to us. We just need to take that step and trust him. Right? We need to understand what's been done for us on the cross, why it had to be done, why that separation, why that separation of sin was permanent between us and God before it was dealt with because the, the sacrifices of animals and the blood of animals was not going to cover the sin of man, right? So Paul says, look, you know, all these things that come at us on a daily basis, think of the things that Paul went through, all the persecution, the stoning, the imprisonment, all those things, right? No matter the horrible things that either you can imagine or that are real that the world will throw at you, no matter what terrifying thing happens, Nothing, none of those things can separate those of us who are in Christ from the love of God. Nothing, nothing. And so when we, when we take this all in, when we really come to a, 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 an understanding, you know, thanks be to God, through the Holy Spirit, through his word, we come to this deeper understanding, knowing all of this. If God is truly for us as he is, who then can be against us?